Yeah, we are the 25th largest project on GitHub right now. Um, we've passed huge things like Next.js or Go or React Native. I check the, the GitHub trending um, repos a lot, and you guys are always up there. So, like, at the top of everything, not just AI. I wanted to ask. So, let's say you do. A, let's say you make a really complicated task. You go through like multiple, multiple loops and. You finally get it to work, right? Now, now I exit off and everything like that. Now, is there a way that it stores that prompt that I can go back in and kind of just build off that last loop? Or do I have to go through all the loops again? Hi, y'all. I'm Nick Tindall. I am a developer on AutoGPT, a AI agent that can help you accomplish tasks. Um, my background is a little complicated. Uh, I've done a little bit of everything in the engineering world, um, well, computer engineering world. Um, I went to school for computer engineering, haven't finished yet, one day though. Um, started that many moons ago. And I've worked at a couple different companies as a DevOps engineer, data analyst, um, head of engineering, uh, and just general software engineer. Uh, done all kinds of roles. Um, now I am at Dialexa, an IBM company, where I am a consultant. What school did you go to? Uh, I'm still going to the University of North Texas. Uh, I live in Denton. We have there's IBM, uh, some kind of building, IBM buildings in, in uh, Cleveland as well. I don't know what. I'm sure they're everywhere, but I just noticed them. They're, they're pretty big <laughs> yeah. IBM buildings. So, yeah, yeah they're it's, all a good, it's, good, it's a good world to be in consulting. So, yeah, and as I said, kind of before we got on here. I, I'm kind of have roots in Texas as well. I, that's where I uh, did my master's studies, not at Baylor. Even though I'm wearing the Baylor shirt, I got this one for free. So. <laughs> I guess I'll go with that. <laughs> Why not wear free shirts? But right. uh, yeah, Texas is great. I love it there. Um, but anyways, uh, to get in kind of the project a little bit, um, AutoGPT, for people who don't know, what, what is AutoGPT? AutoGPT is an experimental AI agent that's goal is to accomplish directed tasks that are assigned by a user, right? At its core, it works by splitting a problem apart and attempting to solve it step by step and outputting things along the way. Very cool. So how does that work for like, okay, let's say I'm I'm the average Joe and I think, well, that sounds pretty cool. I have some somebody accomplish my task for me. How do I do that? How does it work practically? Yeah, so we go through uh, what we call the agent loop. Um, so... We'll get dig into that a little bit, but for the average Joe, you'd basically start it up and our install process is non-trivial right now. We're working on that, but you'd start it up. You, uh, it would ask you a couple questions such as, Hey, what are you trying to accomplish? Right? What's your objective? What's your task? You'd give it all that info. Uh, and it would start step by step going through what we call the agent loop. The agent loop is basically a breakdown of a couple different things such as, Hey, what is my next little plan? Right? take plan its next steps. That is, hey, uh, in order to say, I don't know, research this project, right? I need to Google the project or X, Y, or Z, right? And from there, it will plan to do something else, right? And then execute, and then it'll plan, and then execute, and plan and execute over and over and over as it iterates towards its goal, right? Along the way, we do a couple of different things, such as breaking down your goals, allowing it to execute commands, and asking the user for clarification. Right. So as part of this agent loop, there is a step that you can optionally turn off in what we call continuous mode. I don't recommend that if you don't like big bills. <laughs> but you can basically tell it, don't ask me for feedback, just go for it. Right. Otherwise, every step or every instance of the loop you'll be asked to provide feedback or uh, tell it, yes, you can do that command, right? These commands could be lots of different things. Uh, the simplest are read or write a file. The more complex ones are interact with an API or call a different LLM, right? All the way up to making another agent to do things, right? That doesn't work super great right now, but it was a, a step along the experimentation pathway that we're on. But as a person trying to use it, you would follow this process, right? And at the end, it would output various artifacts using these commands, such as a file, or it could tweet. Well, not anymore, because Twitter locked down their API. It could post a blue sky. 
right. or it could send an email, right? There's various things it can do. Uh, and at the end, it just stops. So how long does the process usually take or how long do the loops take? Uh, each loop in and of itself can take anywhere from five seconds if it's really bad, right? If you throw it here, uh, you know, this is an experiment after all. Um, to around 25 to 30 seconds for each iteration, right? Because behind a loop is a whole bunch of different steps. Um, each one of these can have multiple, like to the like open AI service. So each one of those takes a little bit of time to execute and then it repeats. So 30 seconds per step about, um, depends on your internet speed really. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Does it depend on your internet speed, or what's the what's kind of the bottleneck there with the time? Yeah, open AI is uh, bandwidth, realistically. <laughs> gotcha. Very so cool. do you you have like for the APIs, you have an array of APIs or a list of APIs that you guys put into AutoGPT. So, mm -hmm. like, say if you want to order a pizza or something like that, you'd have to tie into a Domino's API or a Papa John's API or something like that. Is that how it works? Yeah, so we have a couple different types of tie-ins, right? We have our commands, which are direct built into the agent itself, right? That's for base level things like reading or writing to a file or calling an API. There's also plugins, which is where your Domino's example would live, is somebody could build out a Domino's plugin, which would provide another command that allows it to order pizza or to send a text message, right? We have a pretty healthy ecosystem of those that are pretty expensive. So you're, it's just a matter of adding, so it, it sounds like the core, you have certain APIs that you deal with, like OpenAI's Open API, but then sort of fringe ones or specific ones, niche ones, those are up to contributors that mm -hmm. will make plugins for AutoGPT? Exactly. Okay, cool. All right, so just a, uh, another thing, what do you do for AutoGPT? What's your role with the, the platform? I, I wear many hats. Um, I do a lot of organization right now. So that is orchestrating our various open source teams to accomplish things in the fields of research, development, or project management and community engagement. Um, those hats are usually right now just orchestrating all the different moving parts, scheduling meetings. Um, I am technically what we call a lead maintainer, I think is the title, um, or maintainer plus or whatever. Uh, the, t the titles don't really matter, I suppose. Okay. We're all volunteers. Um, but I, I organize a lot of stuff. I also work on designing our reARC, our reARC architecture with James and doing our CI CD pipelines and general code reviews. Um, I'm pretty busy at work these days, so I don't have a ton of time for in depth on the ground coding, but I do a lot of reviewing of other people's work uh, and ensuring it follows good design patterns and is actually helpful to the project. And how did the, can you give us a little background on how the project sort of got started? Like who started it and then yeah. how it grew to this point? So many months back, uh, Torin started this project as like an experiment, right? And it still is an experiment. We haven't released a non-experimental version of this, just so setting expectations. Sure. Um, but it started a while back with Torin just trying to upload a little Python loop that did a simple agent loop where it would plan, ask for feedback, repeat, and execute and repeat, right? It was super simple, uh, basically one Python file. Um, then we had a bunch of people really liked that idea and people started, as I describe it, putting one ball of mud on top of another. Uh, <laughs> so our architecture got messy um, because at the early stages it was, just like an idea that was fun. Uh -huh. And we just pretty much accepted any PR that added a feature, right? So and are you, a, are you making the commits yourself? Uh, not like at this, well, this is before I joined. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, I joined during this process. Uh, All right. I started organizing this a little bit immediately. Uh, so we just accepted anything that people would join, come in. Um, and a lot of that was volunteer, right? Like community contributions, not Torin or any of the other devs. Um, you can look at our contributors, contributors list is huge. Um, I think it's like 300 people have worked on the project. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah, it's insane. Um, so we just accepted basically anything. Um, whenever I joined, we started to focus on actual features that improved the user experiment experience, 
or enhanced it in some way, right? You couldn't just change this line to get your name in the project anymore. Around this time, we started to work on developing the plugin system so that we didn't have to deal with the hundreds of PRs that were coming in. Uh, there was a ton of comments, tons of PRs, and it was just super overwhelming. At the time, the team was probably around 10 people, and that was just not sustainable, right? For 10 people to manage 100 PRs a day is just impossible, right? Because the five you don't merge yesterday get updates tomorrow, and now you have 15. Now that it's 30, right? With issues. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It grows. Uh, and you can see that still, we still have PRs that haven't been merged. We do our PR thumb Thursdays now to clank, try and clear them out, okay. but all on time. But I started by working on fixing the CI CD pipelines to help evaluate these PRs as they came in to try and reduce the bottleneck on maintainers running these PRs locally and evaluating whether or not this code is good by stripping out the things that fail our tests first, or that don't pass our code coverage guidelines, right? Doing a lot of basic level, hey, we need to filter these into good quality ones up front. What, what code, are you, what's it mainly written in? What, what language? Uh, most of the project is written in Python. Uh -huh. Almost all of it, actually. Okay. There's a little bit of like other things dashed Most throughout. of the projects are written in Python nowadays. So. Yeah. It's really easy for people to pick up and learn. So that's really helpful as well. So you hinted at this, but what would you say is the biggest complication with auto GPT right now? So the biggest complication is our convoluted code base and we're working on resolving it actually. Uh, we have just recently merged a core of a new re-architected system that is easier to contribute to, easier to swap components out of, and overall just less tightly coupled into a spaghetti ball and more into a well interfaced system. And why, why do you say it's very convoluted? What's What's going wrong there? <laughs> um, so we have our plugin architecture was designed without a ton of context on what types of things people would want to change out. So we work off a hooks based system, which allows you to intercept the code operate flow at a, probably 15 different points and just change it, right? So the code flow can respond different things and the expectations of what can be responded to that are complicated, right? Alongside that, there is imports between files that shouldn't really do that because, oh, this piece of code was useful to this person. I can just pull this in and reuse it, right? We have lots of that where there is no separation between like module sections where that say the thing that counts tokens could be used in 14 different places and there's just 14 copies of it. Right. So if you change it one place, you got to change it 14 other places. Whereas that should really just be a thing that counts tokens as its own entity. Uh, that's not a great example because I think we already moved that, but we're working towards cleaning it up. Right. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think is like the biggest? Do you see that as the biggest threat to your success with Auto GPT, or do you see some other bigger threats that you're working to overcome? I see. I see that as a huge threat. Uh, it makes it hard for people to pick up our project and just use it. Um, especially developers who want to build on top of it, right? Building a plugin right now is at best hard. <laughs> um, swapping out our LLM provider is basically impossible, right? Um, we've been working to make some of that stuff easier, right? Whether that is adding the capability of swapping out the base URL, which we now have. So you can use like GPT for all, or you could Right. We're doing like these intermediate solutions, but the biggest problems is it's really hard for devs to onboard into the system and then even harder for people to use the system to accomplish things they want with changes they've made. Right. If you wanted to change the agent loop, for example, which is something our research team does often, you have to go rewrite like 15 files, right? Yeah. Because the agent loop flows through all these files and really complicated code paths. Whereas with our redesigned stuff, it's you change the planning module out and it has a straight up interface where anybody could rewrite their own planning module. And as long as they correspond to that interface, that's your new planning module, right? So we worked really hard to replace some of these things. Um, but from a code perspective, that's our biggest problem for sure. Now you guys are open source project, correct? Yep, we're MIT licensed. All right. 
And do, is there a company formed around this, like a nonprofit or something like that? Or uh, we're working on figuring a lot of this out. Uh, uh -huh. It kind of blew up overnight. <laughs> Uh, as far as like time scales go for forming a company yeah. or figuring all that out. Uh, right now it's under the significant gravitas organization just for, Hey, it can't live under one guys forever. Uh, you can't have team management and stuff like that under one guys. Um, I'm hoping we're going to figure something out soon. Um, right. but I'm not the guy to do that. Yeah. And it seems like that, like the most important thing is the code. So if you take care of that, everything else will take care of itself, you know? It's exactly. Like, yeah. Like that. If you so, keep your code high quality and usable and people want to use your stuff, yeah, the other problems will solve themselves. Sure. One of the things is, our, you mentioned um, when we first got on on this, this um, podcast is that you, you guys are working on a, a more friendly, uh, user-friendly UI interface. Mm -hmm. um, what... So that's, I'm assuming that's just like a website someone can go to and type in their, what they want the agent to do. Yeah, exactly. So you can actually sign up for our wait list for it. Oh, uh, cool. The link is at agpt.co. Uh, there should be a register where you can uh, get waitlisted. Uh, we're working on a lot of stuff to make that possible. The main part was that re-architecture we talked about to be able to swap out the user facing portions, right? Which is right now a command line application with something more web facing like an API, right? Are you able to see the projects that are being done by auto GPT? Um, people, <laughs> people share a lot with us. Um, some of it's not asked for. Um, <laughs> we don't have any uh, like data recording right now. We're looking yeah. into integrating with some just to detect bugs. But we get a lot of people who come back with some very interesting use cases. Um, I think the most realistic of some of them are the prosumer help me do X, Y, or Z thing realistically. Um, hey, I need to write 4,000 emails, right? Maybe 4,000 is a lot. But hey, I need to go research this thing, right? Go build a package for me, bring it back, right? Whereas there's some people who ask it to research I don't know, <laughs> like their ancestors, right? Like that's something that is theoretically possible. Um, it's not going to find a ton of success because uh, it can't go to the library, right? Yeah. Um, not yet. We, you know, we'll see what we can do about that. But yeah. we get some really weird uh, requests for what people want it to do. I can imagine. I bet. <laughs> you only hear your imagination. Only go take you so far there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you? Um... So what do you see the future of this project looking like? Okay. So that was my chair. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the future of this project, I think, is a ton of potential. Um, internally in the team, we've discussed a couple different things. Uh, the re-architecture makes us more capable to be a library. So tools like GPT Engineer or GPT Research, or, or all these different various projects, which implement a very similar auto GPT like based run loop, instead of having to reconstruct all these tools by hand and like building out reading file modules or all these different things could instead build out tools on top of ours, right? Because we're an open source project and they won't have to deal with all the upkeep of all the extraneous stuff, right? Um, for example, GPT Engineer is an awesome project, but at its core, it's a series of very excellent prompts, right? And around that, they do some things for handling user questioning and stuff like that, right? Which could easily be built on top of our re-architecture and save them a ton of time, right? So that's one way I see it as a tool for developers, right? As a tool for consumers, I can see this in the prosumer area first, um, acting similar to what I described earlier a research tool or a simple thing you can assign workflows to, right? Uh, hey, I need to research and email these 20 perspective like leads, right? Like so assume I'm in sales. I need to research and email these 20 perspective leads. Go tell me everything you can about these companies and these people, and I'll review the emails and shoot them out, right? Throw them in my drafts or whatever. I can see those as very realistic near-term solutions, like near-term things. Long term, I think it's a little more up in the air. Um, we can all imagine the pie in the sky of, oh, wow, it's an AGI that can do anything. 
I think that's a little unrealistic. Um, and also maybe you don't want that. <laughs> uh, we're not going to dig into to that too much, but there is a lot of potential in this project and I'm really excited to see where it goes. It's, and it seems like, and tell me if I'm wrong, is the, the, the only bottleneck to how big this can grow is what the, uh, the plugins can do. Like, so if there's an API for something that you guys can tell the external application to do, whether it order, be order a pizza, uh, order food somewhere, um, set up an appointment to get your oil changed. Like right. as long as there's an API, the, 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 it's endless. You know, the possibilities are endless at least. Right. And we've seen other projects come out that are UI automation tools where it can automate your browser. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're looking at how those maybe can integrate. So it's not even just limitations of the APIs, it's limitations of what you can do at a computer. Right. There's a lot of potential avenues we can go down, but the ecosystem is really important to it. Right. And that's part of why we've gone through so much effort doing this rearchitecture is now instead of building a very, very complicated plugin, you can implement one interface and congrats. Now auto GPT can use it. Right. Okay. We've been working with a couple different teams, trying to get some of those better, uh, get some initial versions of those going, but I'm not ready to talk about those yet. Sure. You now it seems like this is kind of the direction that AI is going. Uh, do less work, have AI do more of the work for you. Do you see this kind of as the general direction of AI or what other areas of AI do you think are uh, going to develop more rapidly in the next few years? I think this one's going to get a lot of focus, um, not necessarily because it deserves it, but because it's going to make things more efficient, right? Everything that can make something more productive gets a ton of in attention, right? You can look back in time through the, you know, dot com or the like cloud transitions or all these different like web 2.0, you know, all these different things. And realistically, they all boil down to making an existing process more efficient. Um, AI is going to revolutionize that for sure. Right. You can already see that with uh, 10,000 SaaS that startups that have popped up for, hey, I can generate this X, Y or Z thing. Right. And that's awesome. But I think we'll see a lot of those slowly fade away as tools that are capable as multimodal or similar come out that are able to, you know, do any of that because you just ask it to. What's the, what, what would you say, like the, the top few prompts for auto GPT that work really well right now? Because like you said, it's an experiment. Like if someone tries to go in there and type out their, their biggest dream, it's not going to work. Right. Because it's not, yeah. it's not that far enough along yet. Maybe it's not impossible ever, but what are some things that work really well right now for prompts to, to put into auto GPT that someone can do right now? One of our maintainers is actually really good at making these. A um, couple suggestions to start off with. It'll generate you a default prompt based off a of one-liner. You can use that, but if you go ahead and change those default goals, you can make it a lot more efficient. Another thing is you can put gates behind things, right? So you can say, if this file exists, do that as part of your goals, or if X or Y, do Z. Uh, that can help a ton, right? It struggles to keep track over long periods of time. So if you can give it ways to keep it on track, that's really helpful, right? So an example, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. It, Luke, made, he, Luke made a little doc on this. Let me get it. Sorry, I got to log into Discord. You know how it goes. What's the Discord channel that people could go to? to uh, it's going to be Prompt Showcase. Um, and that's just for AutoGPT? Um, yeah, it's in our Discord channel. Um, for example, right, doo, doo, doo. he added a couple goals and doing them manually is really helpful, right? You can put a ton of content into these. Um, for example, he wrote, I, I'll just send it to y'all. This is a terrible thing to read out loud. <laughs> uh, but basically, if, if X file doesn't exist, do Y, then do Z, then A, B, C, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, you can look at GPT engineer, for example, mm -hmm. for some help on how to write these prompts well, and then you can do other steps. So he says, after you've done all that in step two, do Z, right? Once 
the file exists. And then finally, whenever you've done that and this other file exists, do this, right? Um, I'll send you all a so link. So that's all in one initial prompt, or is it, it you yeah. ask it, you see if a file exists and then it wait for it to see if it exists or not and then enter a new prompt? Yeah, yeah. So GPT, auto GPT can have a series of goals, right? Uh -huh. um, and it has an objective and goals. So whenever you run it by hand, like automatically, as there's not a real good word for it, but in the default mode, it'll ask you for a one line prompt and it'll generate these by hand. It'll generate these automatically and it'll turn your uh, one line into an objective and five or so goals. Or you can write those by hand. Um, you should definitely write them by hand for right now uh, if you want it to be highly effective, right? It can be pretty useful if you don't, but I've sent a link in our private chat here showing how you can do this very well, right? Yeah, we got it. Cool. I wanted to ask, so let's say you do, a, let's say you make a really complicated task. You go through like multiple, multiple loops and you finally get it to work, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now I exit off and everything like that. Now, is there a way that it stores that prompt that I can go back in and kind of just build off that last loop? Or do I have to go through all the loops again? Uh, not yet. So you'd be able to keep the artifacts you have artifacts, right? And that's where stuff like what I was talking about was if X, like if X verifiable step exists, continue, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's able to pick that back up. But we're working on making the agents more capable of being stopped and started and keeping those contexts in that, um, that history, if you will. So that whenever you're saying, hey, I got to go to lunch because, you know, I'm hungry. Don't run without me. I can stop it and come back and pick that back up, right? Or, hey, you know, my bill is $40 right now from OpenAI because they like money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll come back later, right? Um, yeah. I mean, have, what, have you ever seen, like, or seen anything happen where the bill... <laughs> gets to like a thousand bucks for someone or something like that. Like something that, you know, um, not for an individual, no. but for yeah. like our organization and testing, uh, uh -huh. we get a, we get a big bill. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not the person who pays it, so I'm not going to dig into it too much, but okay. Okay. Uh, go crazy. Our, <laughs> our, our mainline contributors and maintainers, we help supplement that cost for sure. Yeah. So what, what is the cost? Yeah. So auto GPT in and of itself doesn't actually cost money. Um, right, we're an open source project. Right. However, we call out to various APIs that do, right? Um, whether that's, oft, often that's OpenAI, where they charge you for every API call, right? So, hey, I want to complete this. Like we provide a prompt and it kind of like ChatGPT where it replies back, right? We do the same thing, but programmatically. Um, not quite the same, but we're not going to dig into that. Uh, we do a similar thing programmatically where we send it a message and it replies to us, but that costs money, right? Usually it's three to 15 cents, depending on how much it replies and how much we send it um, for GPT-4. Um, those costs can add up pretty quickly because each time you go through the agent loop, it makes three to five of these calls, right? Okay. So each step can cost anywhere from nine cents to a dollar, right? Ideally not, right? We're working on some ways to make that a little cheaper, um, looking into some alternatives. Uh, and there is, cheap, like, that's part of the reason we enabled changing your API endpoints. So you can use tools like GPT for all. Uh, and there's a couple others we recommend, I think, in our repo for reducing those costs so it can run it locally using different models, right? By far, that is the biggest cost is what OpenAI charges our users directly. I did, I did take, when I installed the auto GPT, I did take your advice setting up the limits in opening eyes. So that's nice. They have that at least you can say only spend $5 and then after that cut me off. So that, that, yeah. that will help a lot of people. Do you get any complaints on discord or anything, or do people just basically go to open AI? <laughs> a lot of complaints. Um, <laughs> a lot of people think it's us that is charging the money. I think. Right. That's what I'm thinking. Um, and trust me, dog, I get the bills too. Yeah. <laughs> I sympathize with the people who are frustrated by the costs, yeah. Uh, especially with the people who are very new to using AI tools and aren't super great at constructing prompts. It can be really frustrating whenever it didn't work and you got a bill, right? Right. Um, 
Do you see a way that's, that that could be fixed in the future, or is it just kind oh, of going to be what it is? What, what do you absolutely. think the solution looks like? Um, there's a couple different solutions on the horizon. Um, prompting as is will probably become more and more flexible over time, right? The exact things I'm looking for will become easier to get the AI to produce, right? And you can see a lot of that with the examples of, I don't know, uh, OpenAI posted about the death of prompting at some point, or somebody from their team did, I can't remember the actual post. But prompting as a whole will get significantly easier over time. And then as we support other LLM providers, right? Um, those prompts will probably get easier because they'll compete naturally and the cost will go down. Right. Yeah. That's economics people. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So you said you have a background in this sort of stuff. How did you get into AI? <laughs> okay. I'm going to sound like, uh, I'm going to sound like a total bro. So I was head of engineering for a crypto company. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, the crypto yeah. NFT guy. Right. Yeah. No, not an NFT guy. Uh, I was doing verifiable identities. And I did okay. Uh, they're a cool company. It's uh, called Sonar. Um, yeah, they're a great company. They're working on some very cool tech. Um, and I ended up leaving that. Um, it was a lot of work, uh, really stressful. Um, and I started to just do consulting. Uh, and in my free time, I was working on whatever the latest, you know, cutting edge technology was looking into generative AI. Cause we, we had played with it a little bit at our, uh, crypto thing. Cause you know, as you do, right. You're on one side <laughs> of the technology, might as well look at another, uh, we sure. played around with it a little bit. So I started looking into it a little more cause I thought it sounded pretty cool, uh, and got a little bit more familiar and saw auto GPT. saw they definitely needed help managing their repo. And that was something I had a lot of experience with from my time working with open source in the past with the Arcane Algorithm Archive, which is a niche of a niche of a niche. Um, and then figured I could help a little. So started writing pipelines and stuff to make it a little more efficient. Are you still doing consulting on the side or are you? Yes, that's actually my mainline job right now. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So, hey, if you all need consulting. Yeah, consulting in terms of just like pretty much anything related to Python code or? So I actually work for a full-on consultancy. We do uh, product delivery design and everything in between. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. Try cool. to keep my work and, you know, play separate though. It's the best thing. And you said chat or, or you said uh, AutoGPT has how many people volunteering right now? Um, so that's a complicated number. <laughs> 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 um, I was working on figuring this out so I could actually come with an answer to that question. Um, <laughs> we have about 10 mainline maintainers. Uh, we have approximately 50, what we call catalysts. Those are people who have actively contributed in a help, very helpful way to the project. And then we have a hundred or more, uh, like actual code contributors or people who have contributed in non-code ways. Right, whether that's writing documentation, working on social media, publishing. Um, like one of our guys works does a really good job working on our YouTube videos, explaining how to do some of this stuff. Right, uh, he's also done code though. But <laughs> we have a ton of people. I think it's over 150 in our Discord. Um, probably 50 of which are active uh, at any moment, working on stuff. Wow, that's really that's cool. awesome. Yeah, we are uh, definitely a worldwide organization that is not an organization, and that's insane. Uh, that's why I spend a lot of time organizing. <laughs> yeah. say, how do you guys well, stay organized? How do you stay on the same page and get things across? So we work a lot in GitHub issues. Um, my favorite issue number is 4770, which is detailing our re-architecture. Um, we spend a lot of time communicating there and in Discord, and we host weekly maintainers meetings. Um, I will definitely say this is an area that we struggle with for sure. Uh, there's not really a good example of how open source teams structure themselves, right? right? That aren't backed by some external company or whatever, right? You can look at W3C, but they're like a whole entity. Or you can look at React, but there's a company behind that, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of 
new field games we play, right? Most of the maintainers recently got an email. <laughs> so we can actually schedule events, right? Rather than sending around calendar links, hoping for the best. Um, but we're, we're actively working on that problem because it's, it's a real challenge. Yeah, it seems like an interesting dynamic. So when I was an undergrad, I went for business management. Something that always stuck out to me was how different businesses were structured. So when you say that, it kind of piques my interest is, you know, I, as you say that, I don't, I don't think there is really a model yet for how these open source companies are structured. It seems difficult. I mean, you have a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds. It's difficult to get everybody on the same page. It's difficult to communicate uh, also. So, you know, that's that's a challenge I think a lot of companies are facing right now. And I yeah. think somebody, somebody's eventually going to start to figure some stuff out. Yeah, there's a couple of companies working a little more publicly than others. Um, right. We've taken some looks at like GitLab, for example on how they organize their building and public teams, mm -hmm. right? Or I don't know what they call them exactly, but like they have a public first, like employee handbook and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And we've also been looking at the Home Assistant project a ton. Oh, I, love Home Assistant. I was just working on that today. So. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, I have a Home Assistant instance at home and I actually did a presentation on work at work about some of the automations we've been doing with it in our office. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's so cool. But we've been looking at them uh, for a little bit of inspiration as well. But yeah, it's a real challenge. Hmm. If anybody uh, has the perfect solution, let me know. Have you thought about, I mean, not going back, getting into crypto or anything, but like setting up a DAO or something like that. So it'd be sort of an autonomous company. I've talked with a couple of people about it. I don't think it'd be a perfect fit for us yeah. um, just because we operate in so many different jurisdictions. Um, paying people with a DAO is complicated. I actually was a steward of developer DAO, which you may or may not know about. No. Um, it is a DAO community of developers who work to mentor and grow people and their development life cycle. Um, awesome group of people, love them all. Uh, just don't have enough time to do both. <laughs> um, yeah, we've, I thought about it a lot. Um, yeah and how we can best manage it but it's a real challenge right you can't you can't operate a DAO in every jurisdiction right i think the only place i know like i looked into it a little bit too last year when they were when the craze was happening like wyoming lets you set one up but then like you said if you have to pay someone in a different country it sort of complicates things right you know. and then we're from day like if we started a company for example we'd be international from day one i don't mm -hmm. think a single core maintainer lives in the same state in the US, okay. little, um, half of them don't live in the same country. Hmm. Um, <laughs> right. And I don't think any of the other core maintainers outside of the US live in the same country. Right. We have guys in the Netherlands, we have guys in New Zealand, we have guys in, you know, the UK and Germany, right? Like from the literal start, if we did start a company, for example, it would be a problem. <laughs> and a DAO would just complicate that a lot. Yeah. So a regulation nightmare, it seems like, like yeah. but you'll, you'll figure it out. Yeah. I, I've looked into and talked with the team about a bunch of different options, and I frankly don't know what's the best. Yeah. Seems like one of those things where you, it, as long as you keep chugging along with the code, everything else will take care of itself, you know, just yeah. growing things. Yeah. Um, well, are you guys, are you, like, where is, where, how are you paying for, like, server bills and things like that? Like, and how is it yeah. hosted right so Torin, the founder of the project, actually set up a GitHub sponsored program. Mm -hmm. So we have various individuals actually pay for all that for us, right? So we receive awesome. donations on our oh, cool. um, repos that basically allow us to pay for our, our, our Google Cloud bills and our OpenAI bills. We don't have a ton of bills outside of that other than like tooling for maintainers to use to build our projects like Whimsical or like G Suite so we can email each other, right? Um, but we actually don't have a ton of costs, right? Because we don't have health insurance because we're not a company yet, right? Like we don't have payroll because who would you pay, right? Like when you have 300 people who have contributed, it's really hard to make those determinations, right? Um, sure. I don't think the guy who has to decide that if we do that. 
And is there a debt to decide that, or is it? That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> which, yeah, how do you guys make decisions? Is it majority rules, or so for decisions? Um, generally, there's each team member, like each of our maintainers, um, is very competent in their area. Um, so they come with a proposal, and we either accept or deny it. Uh, deny with changes or accept with changes or whatever. Uh, there's a little bit of a process around it, but not much of one. It's often, hey, here's what I'm thinking. Do you all think this is a terrible idea? Yes or no? Um, we don't often run into things where outside of code we have to make determinations. Um, we have, for example, monitoring our Discord. We have some rules we all agreed to, and they're all pretty reasonable, right? Like, don't spam. Don't advertise things in our server, right? Like, all of the decisions that need to be made are pretty straightforward and we're all pretty reasonable people. So there's not a whole lot of arguments. So awesome. So far, so good. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're doing it with, uh, you know, a hundred to 300 people or whatever the actual number is, that's pretty, that's pretty good. I mean, yeah. to be able to piece everything together right now without paying anyone and having the company there. So or yeah. like a company without a company. Yeah. So. It's wild. Um, we've built informal like organizational structures, right? So I'm a lead maintainer, right? Which means I can add people to the GitHub repo and there's others who can move people between teams and there's people who can request to be added or all. So we have a bunch of weird informal structures that I'm working on identifying um, just so we can figure out what everybody is following. <laughs> so we can at least try and agree to the same pathways. So, so what is the motivation for most of these people for contributing to the project? Because they're not getting paid for it. They're not getting health insurance. It's just because they love the project and they, they're passionate about it. Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, for a lot of people, they love the project and they're just passionate about what they build, right? That's very um, cool. A lot of people are really excited because it's open source, right? Like they want to contribute to that, right? They want to make it better or they're users of the tool. They just said, I'm tired of this part not working good. I can make it better, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and we love that, right? That's the kind of ethos we love to support. Is there like an interviewing process for these people that are coming on board or <laughs> what, what's the criteria? How do you, I mean, you decide? It's like, how do you decide who's on board and who's not? <laughs> yeah. So if there's an interviewing process or not, um, it's complicated. Uh, basically anybody can be a contributor, right? The criteria is, did you contribute something to the project? Right. Um, whether that is, did you tell us? Hey, you're doing great today? Or did you write code, right? Anybody, basically anybody can be a contributor if they just want to be. Um, then we have our catalysts. Uh, we have a multi-tiered system, right? Um, to help these decision-making structures. We have catalysts who are contributors who contributed multiple times, right? Like, hey, you didn't just tell me I was doing great today. You also helped somebody in the Discord 400 times, whatever, right? That's an extreme example. But you clearly care about the project. You plan to stick around for more than this feature right? or whatever. Right. Then we have our lead catalysts, which are the people who help organize those. Right. Um, they are technically maintainers as well, which is the next year. Maintainers are catalysts who have changed the large scale shape of the project, helped guide it and or helped make large scale decisions around, say, code movement or architectural patterns, like large, complicated, multi, multi-step feature development, right? That one has interviews, interviews, right? You get on with a couple of maintainers and talk to them, but by that point, you've already been working with us for a while, mm -hmm. right? And your interview was your work you've done, right? right? It's not like at a company where, hey, I want to work here, okay apply it's like hey i want to work here make a pr right open an issue contribute right like it's public just do it and if you're good at that you'll be invited up right i don't know it's kind of weird yeah. <laughs> so anyone well, it's, cool. it's, it's like you have to prove yourself yeah. kind of you know through your yeah. code or marketing or whatever it may be it's right like exactly we actually have some people who do marketing who have never written a line of code don't know how to read it Right. But they're like, I can write a mean tweet. And they do. Right. right. <laughs> There's a lot that's, of people who can write. Mean that's just as important sometimes as, as <laughs> writing the code to spread the word. So, yeah, it's different work, but it's still just as meaningful. Sure. What are like a, a couple of 
things in regard to monetization. Are, are you, it's, you're an open source project, so it's a little bit different, but are you guys looking for VC funding? And if you are not, do you, are, and you, when you release the web interface, are you going to charge, is there going to be a, a fee for, for those prompts that, you know, when people type those in or what does that look like? Uh, I'm not the guy who would handle that. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I do a large scale organization of our projects yeah. and directions. Um, we have a couple other team members like Torin who are far better equipped to answer those kind of questions. Okay. Um, no worries. Yeah. Just, uh, I expect he has answers, but that's not my role. <laughs> okay. And you keep saying Torin. What's Torin's name? The developer? Oh uh, yeah. That's Torin. Uh, it's, it's his actual name. Um, Torin Bruce Richards. I think that's his last name. Hold on. Let me grab it for you. Yeah, Torin Bruce Richards. Um, he was the initial dev. Uh, he was actually a game dev way back um, before this whole thing started. I don't know if he is actually anymore, but that's for him. Um, he'd be the kind of guy who helps with the larger scale like business decisions, right? Because technically, even though this is all MIT licensed and you can copy it, it's all under the organization that Torn made because he started it and went, oh man, we need to make this an organization now because I can't let other people manage this code at scale without making it an organization and so on. Um, and he works with a couple others on our team to do that side of stuff, figuring all that out. Um, I definitely work more on the open source side, um, trying to get this community built, right? And, w and when did the project launch? Oh man, <laughs> launch is a rough word. We haven't released version it's one. Still launching. <laughs> yeah, um, we haven't released version one yet. Uh, so when did it launch is a fun question. When will it launch? <laughs> I don't when know. When will it launch? That's even worse. Another fun one. <laughs> um, I don't know. Three four months ago maybe. Um, yeah. It's not. It's really not that old. And somehow in that time we became the twenty fifth largest project on GitHub. Uh, I think a lot of that is due in part to how you have to run the project. Uh, you have to clone the repo. And when you do that, it's like, hey, you should star this so you can come back to it later. Uh, so that helped us grow really quickly. And uh, you said you've been with working on it for how long? Uh, two, three months, probably. Um, oh, okay. So very most close of that to time. The, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, definitely most of his lifetime. Um, it's been pretty cool. Uh, really love the team. Really love the project. We've gone through a lot of large scale code changes in the time. What's the uh, biggest area of growth you've seen since the beginning? Our interactions with our community for sure. Right. Um, we struggled very, very heavily with dealing with the level of press and contributions and issues and all manner of things, right. That come along with, Hey, you're on the front page of news now, or, Hey, you're being talked about in Congress, um, in the U S at least we, we've done a really good job as a team adapting to the changes that they came as they came up and rising to meet them. Um, I'm really proud of the team for that. We've done a whole lot of code fixes and improvements, but by far, uh, We've done a great job building community. Yeah, congrats. I mean, it's it's no small feat to do what you guys are doing. Um, yeah. It's really awesome. Wow. Can you see, like, how many prompts? I know, like, right now you have to download it locally pretty much to to have an auto GPT work. Can you see how many prompts total have been, like, submitted to you guys? No, I can't see how many have been submitted. We don't do, actually, any form of metrics right now. Um, we're wow. working on integrating with a couple different tools to help identify bugs and that would probably be something that comes alongside that. But one of the cool features we can see is how many people have starred the repo and how many people have cloned the repo. Um, that's on a rolling two week window, but it was crazy waking up some days and seeing millions of people have cloned this repo for the first time in the past day. Right. Oh, yes. yeah. It's like not today maybe, but like, um, I, I, I don't even think I can check anymore. We've, we've been working well, on like, it. I check the, the GitHub trending um, repos a lot, and you guys are always up there. So yeah, like, um, at the top of everything, not just AI stuff. Yeah, we are the 25th largest project on GitHub right now. Um, wow. That's it, over three to four months. That you yeah, started. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I, every I day know. I check it because I still can't believe that we're here. Yeah. Um, we're passing, we've passed huge things like next JS or go or react native, right? You're bigger than next in, in react, right? Like, <laughs> or transformers or, you know, like Kubernetes, <laughs> like, uh, node power toys. Like I, I just looked through the list and I'm like, wow. Right. Yeah. Incredible. That is crazy. Um, we, we definitely <laughs> rode a rocket to the top. Um, yeah. And here's to hoping it doesn't stop anytime soon. We've got a lot of cool features coming out soon. Uh, lots cool. of people have been working really hard on them. When's your, is there any big feature that's coming out? You know, I know it's hard to give timetables anything with code, um, yeah. but is there some big feature that's going to be on the horizon that people can look out for? Um, over the next yeah. Maybe month or two? Yeah. Over the next month or two, we're hoping for our rig architecture to start taking to start being pulled into the repo in ways that are actually impactful to the user, um, whether that's adding support for other LLM providers or adding support for new types of plugins that are way more powerful or making it easier for developers to build their tools on top of it, right? And then we're also working on making it much easier to install because right now, as I'm sure y'all are aware, it's a pain at best. <laughs> um, and then as part of all these things, we're hoping it to make it to where our agents are a lot more capable coming up. But I can't promise any timelines on that last one. Uh, we, we've got a bunch of areas of active research. Um, we've been working on building out research teams. So if you're interested in contributing in that way, let me know. Um, but yeah, we got a couple really cool things on the horizon. Awesome. We'll, we'll, be, we'll, we'll definitely keep our eye on things because this is one of my favorite projects at least. So Yeah, that's very that. cool. Yeah. yeah and so what is there any one is there one plugin that is your favorite, Nick? For out of GPT? There's some plugins that are just ridiculous to me. Um that are just show me how much people can just make whatever they want. Um this is gonna sound ridiculous. Uh there's people who have built amazing plugins from you can work with it in Telegram to it can read your text messages, right? But my favorite one is one that just tells you how many astronauts are in space right now. <laughs> it's a super simple plugin that works off a of space API. Um, but it was built by a guy who didn't know anything about coding. And yeah. he got a plugin merged went to our main plugin repo that, and he was really proud of it that allowed him to see how many astronauts were in space. Right. And it really goes to show you the power of AI to help a developer do something that they're very uncomfortable with and very unfamiliar with yet still accomplish their goals. Right. And it kind of helps show the ethos of auto GPT, which is enabling everyday people to accomplish things that they couldn't before. Right. That's a, that's a great headline right there. <laughs> or yeah, quote, I'm a, so. I'm, don't worry. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, you know, we try to keep it, keep our time timeline on track. I don't know if this was scheduled for an hour, but I think it was around there. So yep. we, we, we appreciate your time. You've got a lot of, a lot of things to do <laughs> uh, for your, for your consultant work and for auto GPT. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining us here today. And I'll just leave it up, up to Hunter if you got anything else. Yes. So thanks for joining us, Nick. We appreciate you a lot uh, coming on here. Uh, yes, we'll, sure. we'll hope to stay connected with you. If there's any future projects, maybe we can talk a little more you know, we can get in depth and maybe some of the updates or things like that. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. If you were up for it. And then, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, for people who watch or listen, uh, just being subscribed. Ryan and I ha have our AI news letter that we do every weekday, fry-ai.com. You can check it out. You can see all of our previous newsletters. You can see our long form articles that we've done. And on Sunday, which is going to be the 17th or something like that. I can't keep track of days, 16th, something like that. We're going to have our, when you're, when you're in this kind of space, you lose track of that sort of stuff, right? You know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> but we're going to have our, our article out. So when this is out, go, go out, go out down to our article and search it. We'll put it in the comments. We'll put it in the description too for our article about auto GPT. Uh, so you can read a little more in depth about what that is. Check out the project on GitHub. Look at their Discord page, as he said. And if you want to be a contributor 
just start working for the project. That's all you got to do, he said. So, yeah. Pretty cool. Just thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, just we hope you have a great day. Appreciate it. Yeah, Nick, do you have anything uh, anything else you want to plug while you're while we're here? Sure. I mean, uh, Twitter has been replaced by threads, so you can follow me there at Nick Tyndall. Uh, <laughs> um, or, you know, Twitter at Nick Tyndall, same thing. Um, uh, just, yeah, as a developer, I just want to say you can accomplish things, right? Like I never would have imagined I'd be doing an interview for a project I contributed to an open source, right? Take those leaps, try and build new things. Awesome. awesome. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nick. Really appreciate all your work. Thank you.